Our reading today is in the book of Romans, chapter 14. Beginning in verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. these next couple of weeks here at the Northwest Campus and some things that we're doing together with the Keller Campus. So I know you saw the announcement real as we came in this morning, but just want to catch you up on a few things so you know all the details about it. Trunk or Treat is coming up at the very end of this month. That's October 29th from 5 to 6.30. Like the, like the past couple of years, we're going to be out on the front lawn here at J.C. Thompson. And we talked about this for the past couple of weeks. The cool thing is we're joining forces with the PTA here at JCT. Uh, see if I can throw some more acronyms out as we talk about T-O-T on O-C-T-2-9. How about that? <laughs> I'm just really good like that. I can throw them out there. It makes sense. Anyway, they'll be here. we'll be here that night from 5 to 6.30. If you have any questions about what that looks like, uh, we'll be back towards the guest center. There's a trunk or treat sign-up table. You can sign up to host a trunk. You can sign up to bring candy. You can sign up to bring a generator to help out with the bounce houses or run the bounce houses or kind of be a gopher that night and a runner to kind of help things happen. There's a lot going on that evening. We've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people the past couple years that we've done this. I, I fully believe because we're, we're, we're flying with the PTA this year, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be expansive and just blow up. So uh, lots of good things going with that uh, here in just a couple weeks. Lots of plans to get in place, but it's coming, and it's coming very well, very well and it's coming together uh, real soon. Next is a new thing that we're trying out, not tomorrow, but the next Sunday, or I'm sorry, but the next Monday. This is Monday, uh, October 16th from 9 to 11. There's a, let me orient myself. There's a, there's, a, uh, there's a park down here at the end of Serrano Ridge, actually right across the street from where the Quins live, um, that Fady and Charity are getting together and hosting a little play day for mamas, and I guess papas can come too, right, if they want to? Yeah. Dads, bring your kids if you're home for the day. That'll be from 9 to 11. They've got snackages. They've got water. It'll be a good time just to kind of hang out, get ourselves into the community, get to know some people who are around us. The cool thing is that's, that's a day off for Northwest ISD, so that we could have a flood of people coming to the park that day. So lots of good things going on that. As you see this on social media, share that, because there could be some people that we need to know in this neighborhood that we can introduce to the name of Jesus. And then lastly, fellas, you got one of these on the way in. We've been talking about it for a month of Sundays now, I believe, at this point. Beast Feast 2 is coming up next Sunday evening. 30 bucks, you can get your ticket here. Just grab this little card, scan this QR code. This is something that you really want to be a part of. 
Guys, if you have an, an older son, um, Joshua is nine. He's a little too young for this. But if you've got a teenager or, or uh, transitioning into adult uh, son, this would be a great opportunity to worship alongside of him, to listen to the word alongside of him, to eat some barbecue alongside of him. A great opportunity to hang out with some guys uh, at the Keller campus and the Northwest campus. So grab this Beast Feast 2 information card. Kevin can be back at the back of the room, and Danny can be at the back of the room afterwards to answer any questions you have about that. Let me say this. If... If the 30 bucks is, uh, is, is the thing that's preventing you from going to this, uh, talk to me. We'll take care of that. No big deal. We'll make sure that you're there and your people can, there, can be there that evening to hear what the Lord has for us that night. All right. So there you go. As you heard um, Chris read at the beginning of our time together this morning, we're going to be in Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 23. This is kind of a continuation of where we spent some time in the word last week. Paul, Paul is, is getting to the end of the book of Romans. There's only 16 chapters in the book of Romans, so he's getting to the end of that, and he, he's kind of giving some final charges to this church in Rome as he's about to release them to go and do the things that he believes God is calling them to do. It's been, it's been a, a, um, like an earth-shaking study for me as we've gone through Romans. There's not been a week that we've processed something where God kind of hasn't pointed some things out on me and be like, hey, Roger, um, I'm going to shine some light in this little dark corner of your world, and I'm going to change you with my word. And the next week, hey, listen, Roger, there's some things over here in this dark corner of your life that I'm going to shine my light on and change you for the better of, of who I want you to be. Uh, I hope you've experienced some of, that things, some of those things also. We spent a significant amount of time in the book of Romans, and it's been, um, it's been life for me, and I hope our study has been life for you as well. So we continue on. Our bottom line for this morning as we process the end of, the, uh, end of chapter 14 in Romans is this. Uh, walking with Jesus is about building up the right things and tearing down the wrong. Walking with Jesus is about building the right things, putting the right things in place, making sure that the foundation that we stand on and, and the foundation that we're building for our people, for our family, for our city, for our community is, is God-designed and God-oriented and, and kingdom-focused. It's our call as we walk with Christ to put those things in place and to build up those kind of right things. And in the process, what we do is tear down the things that don't matter. No, no, no matter how many times you've circled around this sun, I know that I know that I know that you've identified some things in your life that you've chosen to make very, very important for a season. And now you look back and you can think, man, I don't, I don't know if that was worth it. I don't know if that was worth my investment in time. I don't know if it was worth me, worth me boggling my mind and, and thinking and processing. I don't know if it was worth me taking my family through all that stuff. I, I don't know if it was worth, worth me working 60, 70, 80 hours for a season of time to do that. I, I just don't know. What I do know, though, is as we follow through what Paul has for us at the end of chapter 14, he, he paints some word pictures for us that, that I believe will, will, will allow us to grab a hold of what he wants us to understand for the kingdom of God and the difference it can make in our lives personally, the difference it can make in the lives of our families and the lives of the people who are around us, and specifically, very specifically, in the life of the church. What I do know is this, that when we walk with Christ, we orient our lives about building up the things that are right and good and perfect in the kingdom and tearing down the things that, that just don't matter. So we're going to talk about this morning, number one, about how when we judge people, we're essentially setting a trap for them. Uh, number two, we're going to talk about how we as God's people, we're walking on a journey with him every day of our lives. And number three, our goal in life is to build bridges into people's lives, not, not into us, but into the kingdom. So three word pictures to process this morning. The first one is that I want us to process through is this. We can, as the people of God, we, we can set traps for people or, or we can build bridges to people, but we can't do both. We can set traps for people. We can put hindrances and, and obstacles and we can throw things in their way that will trip them up in their pursuit of Christ or we can be about building a bridge to those people, but we can't build a bridge to set traps off and then blow the bridge up and then really mess our people over. We can't do both of those things at the same time. Look what Paul writes in Romans chapter 14, 13. He says, he says this, the very first uh, verse of our passage this morning. He says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Like, we've been doing it. Stop it. We, we can't be about that. Let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather, decide to, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or never to put a hindrance in the way of a brother. See, whether we intend it this way or, or not, whether we even view it this way or not, when we judge people, we talked about this last week, we, we are sitting in the seat of God's authority. And then you and I are, are not designed, we have not been redeemed, we have not been restored, we have not been saved to sit in the judgment seat that belongs to the Father alone. 
when, when we judge people, we're, we're, we're trying to make them in our own image. When we judge people, we're pointing out something in their lives that we see is wrong, and then we're saying to them, stop doing that and start doing this. We point out something in somebody's life, we say, you are way off track, stop that and start doing this. Essentially, what, what we're doing is, is we're, we're, we're usurping God's authority, and it's really mutiny on our parts. We're putting ourselves between the person and God, and that is a very dangerous place to be. We say, basically, I don't like the way you are doing, fill in the blank, and I want you to start doing that thing the way that I do the very same thing. Paul says it this way, don't put a stumbling block in their way, don't put a hindrance in their way. Literally, as people are walking on their path with the Father, don't put anything in their way that would impede them, that would slow them down, that would stop them from pursuing the life that God has created them to fulfill, that God has created them and redesigned them to fulfill. As I was reading through some of this stuff and, and beginning to, to, to pull apart and understand these word pictures that Paul is painting for him, it brings to mind two of my favorite TV shows. One's not on TV anymore, and, and one is one that I catch every episode of, and man, Amanda and I watch it together. Y'all remember Les Stroud and the Survivor Man TV show? You remember that, guys? Did you watch any of that? It's like, ha cha 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 Remember those shows? Those were fantastic. Amanda's shaking her head. She doesn't remember those shows. I watched that one by myself. It was a great one. It's about this guy who goes out in the boonies all by himself. He doesn't have a camera crew. He brings all his own gear, and he makes sure that he basically survives. He, he traps, and he hunts, and he fishes, and he climbs trees, and he digs up roots, and he survives for any amount of days. It's not like the Bear Grylls guy who kind of cheated on some of that stuff. Les Stroud was legit. He did it for real. There's another show, though, that, that really is very, very real as well, uh, and it's not Survivor, totally set up, I believe. It's a show. It's a show called Alone. It's on the Discovery Channel, I believe, and I think it's in their ninth season. They're about to go into their tenth season. Uh, they, they, did, they did one in Australia that I'm trying to catch up on right now. The, the, whole, the whole design behind Alone is they, they, they take uh, 10 to 12 people and set them up in some, some really, really strenuous conditions, and then they leave them to themselves. They have all the gear that they need. They have 10 like luxury items, which a luxury item is uh, like a fishing hook. And then they, 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 set them, they set them loose. They have, they have a satellite beacon to respond if they get into some trouble or if they're ready to quit, and then they walk away. And they, they let these people live alone for however long these people need to live alone. And some people live for about three days, and I think the, I think the person who's been out the longest is like 127 days all by the lonesome, which for about three days sounds pretty amazing. 127 days? I don't think I want any part of that. What I've learned in watching Survivor Man and what I'm watching alone is, is they have these ways of setting these traps for animals that they're trying to catch and kill to be able to sustain themselves for 127 days. And they have, the, they have these things called a figure four trap, which is amazing. You get a, you get a flat piece of rock or a, heavy, or a heavy log, and you kind of suspend it up in the air like this, and then you set a trap underneath it with, with a hair trigger. So that when an animal comes in and nibbles on an acorn or nibbles on uh, a piece of fish that the guy caught or something like that, it snaps that hair trigger and <laughs> lights out. What does that have to do anything with Romans chapter 14? When Paul is saying, don't put hindrances, don't put stumbling blocks in the way of people, Paul is saying this, don't trap people in their ways. The, the Greek word for hindrance is actually the little hair trigger that's in one of those traps, one of those deadfall traps before it falls and squishes the animal. Paul is saying, listen, you people who are judging, stop doing that because what you're doing is you're tricking these people into chasing the father this way. And when they start walking that way, they snap that hair trigger. And we'll read here in just a moment. You are destroying your brother. Just stop. Stop with the stumbling blocks. Stop with the traps. Stop with the hair triggers. Stop with the judgment and just love your brother and love your sister. Trust the Lord with the rest. Walk well and stop trapping each other. We can set traps for people or we can build bridges to people, but it is impossible for us to design to, to, to be a part of both. And Paul is saying very, 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 very clearly, just stop. <clears throat> Number two, uh, as we understand what Paul is talking about in terms of traps, uh, there's several things that we do along the way that can trap people. Number one, we've talked about it a lot this morning. When we judge people, we are setting traps. 
when we judge people, we are, we are putting things in ways that they will trip over, that will make them feel small, that will make them feel in, insignificant, that will make them feel like they don't matter, that will make them feel like we are better than them, and that is not the way that God has designed this to be. We have no claim on the judgment seat. We are all, we, we know this, we are all sinners in need of grace and mercy, and when we judge people, we set traps for them to fall flat on their face. But we have other ways that we do this. We set traps for people when we choose tradition over truth. Look at Romans 14, 14. Paul writes this. He says, I know and I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. This, this, this principle of being clean and unclean is cleared up for people living on this side of the cross in Acts chapter 10, where Peter has this vision of the Lord saying, listen, if I made it, it's clean. If it came from me, the creator, you can take it because it's clean. What, what Paul is being very, very careful to tell the church of Rome is like, listen, you have been set free from the things that bound people in the Old Testament. You have been freed up from those things. And when you run back to those because they were warm, when you run back to those because they were comfortable, when you run back to those traditions because they made you feel closer to God than you are now, just know that you're usurping the authority of Scripture. You are, you are, you are usurping the adequacy, the adequacy of, of Christ, and you are questioning the truth and the authority of the gospel. Stop choosing tradition over truth and run towards truth. Another way that we trap and trip people up along the way is when we default to personal preferences. When we default to personal preferences saying what I want is more important than you want. Paul says this in verse 14. He says, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. These are, these are strong words from Paul to the church. He's saying when, when, when we choose what we want over what somebody else wants, when, when, we, when we elevate our own desires, our own extra biblical or our own unbiblical desires over what somebody else wants, we grieve our brothers. He even says that we destroy our brothers. What he's basically saying is you, you, risk, you, you risk taking your brother off the pathway to Christ and putting him back on the pathway to hell. We have a chance of, of getting ourselves, and we talked about this a moment ago, of putting ourselves between the creator and the people that he, that he is in the process of saying. We have a chance of putting ourselves in the middle of it when we say me over you, when we say I'm before you, when we say I'm more important than you, when I default to my personal preferences. I can also trip people up, we talked about this last week, when I major on minors. There are precious few things in scripture that, that, God, is, that, that God says are absolutely important to our faith. Our Lord and Savior was born of a virgin. Our Lord and Savior lived this life and died a sinless death, was buried, and then was resurrected on the third day. Those are vital to our faith. Our Lord and Savior ascended to heaven. He will come back to rescue his saints. These are vital to the faith. There are several periphery things that circle around this that, that are important to individuals that some of us may have convictions over, but aren't necessarily authoritative, authoritative to our faith in Christ. And we, when we major on those minors, we can trip people up. The beautiful thing about this, though, is that when, when we allow ourselves to kind of back away from that, when we, when we allow a diversity of thoughts under the umbrella of love, under the umbrella of accurate theology, under the umbrella of Christ first to, 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 to define a church, we, we, we have some beautiful body type diversity that the Lord allows his people to be like and it is allows his people to exist among and it is a beautiful beautiful thing uh, Paul brings this up several times in chapter 14 about food and drink and how they're important for nourishing the body but it's not the thing that saves the body we must major on majors and never major on minors and then lastly we set traps for each other when we only draw question marks Paul says this in 1423 but whoever doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith, for, whoever, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. It's important to understand what Paul's talking about here. He says this, in the New Testament, doubt is the exact opposite of an unconditional trust in God. He's not talking about disagreeing philosophically. He's not talking about even being skeptical of the faith or, or uncertain about, uh, about specific areas of the faith. He, he's, he's not embracing battling between faith and proof. We have, sections, we have evidence of scripture in, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament where this, this father had a, had a boy who was possessed by a demon and he ran to Jesus and he says, Jesus, you're my only hope. I've, I've got nothing else. I've tried to save my son and only you can do it. And he says to Jesus, I believe, Jesus, I believe you can do this, but help me in my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. That's, that's not what Paul is talking about. 
When Paul says whoever, whoever has doubts is condemned because it doesn't proceed from faith, it proceeds from sin, what he's saying is the overall questioning of who God is, the overall questioning of the authority of God, the overall questioning of did God really say this and will he really do this? Is Jesus really is who Jesus said he was and did he do the things that he said he did and can he accomplish in my life the same the things that he says he can accomplish? We all have, if I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all have moments where we begin to question our faith, where we begin to kind of draw circles around things and be like, God, is is this really you at work or is this really me trying to make things make sense in my own mind? If we, though, as the body of Christ, will submit our doubts to the authority of Scripture, we will submit our doubts to the authority of the Father, that changes everything. But we set traps for those who are around us when all we do is draw question marks and don't seek after answers and don't seek faith and don't seek reconciliation and don't seek the Father along the way. We got to understand this, that we are on a journey with God. And along the way, he is supplying us and equipping us with all that we need to get us where he wants us to go. But when we judge people, we have this way of, of putting ourselves between us and them. We can get between them and God and we can destroy the work that he is doing in them. When we set traps for people, we can destroy the work that he is doing in them. When we put stumbling blocks in the ways of people, we can destroy the work that he is doing in them. When we judge people, we can destroy the work that God is doing in them. Listen to what Paul writes in 1420. He says, do not for the sake of food. I mean, we're talking about food. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. When when we begin to draw question marks over stuff like this, when we begin to put ourselves between the authority of Scripture and the people that we do life with, we we essentially dismantle the work of God. We begin to pick it apart little by little by little, and we don't seek reconciliation. We don't seek restoration. We don't seek full understanding of what exactly is God, exactly what God is telling us to do in His Scripture, and we destroy the work of God that He is doing in the hearts of the people that He has placed around us. What we have to understand is along the way that God is doing a much larger work than we understand. Sometimes when we get in it, when we're walking closely with people or we begin to have strife with people or there's some friction in relationships, we can get very myopic about what we believe God is doing right here. And sometimes we, 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 have, a, sometimes we have a propensity to miss the forest for the trees. Sometimes we, sometimes we miss the grandiose nature of God's ultimate work when we zone in and zoom in and become myopic about one specific little detail. Paul's being very, very clear. He's saying, listen, don't tear down what God is in the usually very gradual and inoriented process of building up. If you've walked with the Lord, you know this, that, that God is very rarely in a hurry to get things done. If you prayed for patience, God very rarely just grants you patience. If you prayed for faithfulness, God very rarely just gives you faithfulness. If if you've you've asked for the opportunity and the ability to forgive somebody else, God very rarely grants you that forgiveness in the moment. He gives you opportunities to exercise patience. He gives you opportunities to exercise faith. He gives you opportunities to forgive that person little by little by little. But here's the thing. God is in the process of taking time with us And that's his end of the deal because all time is his anyway. And when we try to rush things, when we try to press through things, when we try to grab a hold of things and make things things work the way that we want to make them work, we stand a chance of destroying the work that God is doing in the people who are around us. And it's not not just simply, there's more at stake than just the eternity of people who walk with the Lord. We can destroy the God's work within the church. We can destroy God's work even within ourselves. We can destroy God's work within our family. When we, when we proceed forward and trust God, trust that we, as well as everybody around us, are on a journey with our creator, our hands are wide open, and we trust him along the way. We trust him with the now. We trust him in the later, and this is, this is where the rover meets the road. We trust him in the now getting to the later. That's the hard part. But when we insert ourselves and try to usurp God's authority, we stand a chance of pulling the pin, tossing the grenade, and blowing up the work that God is doing in people's lives. However, what we should be about is this. God gives us and grants us and provides us with and welcomes us into bridge-building opportunities to pursue in order to build his church. God is all about granting us and giving us opportunities to build bridges with those who are around us so that we can pursue those things in order to build up his church. 
along the ways we can refuse to set traps, along the way we, we can refuse to throw out and put out obstacles, we can refuse to judge, along the way we can refuse to get in the way of God's work, and along the way we're building trust, we're developing a reputation, we're becoming known as people who are bridge builders and not booby trap setters. Here's what we know. We have ways that God tells us in these, in these few verses of Scripture that we can actually build bridges. We have the opportunity to design and build these things for the sake of the kingdom. And we can do that when we intentionally pursue the kingdom. Paul says this in verses 17, uh, verses 17 and 19. He says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Fast forward to, to verse 19. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. God says we are to pursue building the kingdom. We are to pursue righteousness. We are to pursue peace. We are to pursue joy in the Holy Spirit. And along the way, as we're doing these things, we are able to pursue the mutual upbuilding of the church. All these things are a package deal that God allows us to be a part of and allows us to step into for the sake of his glory, for the sake of his name, for the sake of his kingdom. We, we build bridges with the people that God has placed around us when we intentionally pursue the kingdom and what God has for us. We build bridges when we, work with me on this one, when we be the we that God made us to be. We can build bridges to those who are around us when we be the we that God has made us to be. Verse 19 says this, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. God is, God is declaring through Paul to the church in Rome, and, and because it has authority over us in Scripture, to the church of us here at Venture Northwest, he's saying, listen, I have given you gifts, I have given you talents, I have given you abilities, I have given you a shape, I have given you a spiritual gifts and a heart and ability and passions and experiences. I have given you this package of goods that I fully expect you to use for the sake of the kingdom. And, and more specifically, I have planted you within a church that is within my kingdom that I fully expect you to use your, 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 your spiritual gifts and your hearts and your abilities and your personality and your experiences, this package of things that I have given you, I'm giving that to you to use for the edification of the church, for the building up of the church so that you may glorify me in all that you do. We talk about this a lot here at Northwest, how we, how we are a body and how we've got fingers and we've got toes and we've got elbows and we've got knees and we've got shoulders and we've got hips and we've got legs and arms and a torso and a hand. We've got feet and we are moving forward. We are, we are symbolically a body of Christ. And God has assembled and is assembling this body to accomplish the mission that he has set us here to accomplish. And every time we talk about this, we talk about this, how a body needs two hands. And a body needs two feet, and a body needs two legs and, and two arms. The body needs the body in order to accomplish the things that God has designed us to accomplish. And God has built you and has gifted you and has created you with some very specific purposes in mind. And I will say this, as a representative of the church known as Venture Northwest, let me be very, very clear. Like, we need you. We, we need you to be you so we can be we. And as a matter of fact, I know that I know that I know that, that, there, are, that there are gifts and talents and abilities that are kind of hidden in this body for whatever reason. Like we're just kind of keeping them in our back pocket just because we don't want to let people know that we're good at fill in the blank. Or that we have a desire and a passion to fill in the blank. Or that we feel called to fill in the blank. Or that we want to be a part of making sure fill in the blank happens. When, when those things begin to be drawn out of the back pocket and brought to the forefront, and we begin to have conversations about what God can use you, can use us to accomplish, man, like the sky is the limit. And, and we begin to focus less on the individual trees, and we begin to see the broad force, the grand force that God is in the picture of building for us to inhabit. We need you to be you so we can be we. God has designed us that way. Paul says this to another church, in the city of Corinth, he writes this, so with yourselves, since you were eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, what he's saying, so, so, so with you yourselves for this church, because you want to see the Spirit at work, because you want to see the Spirit save lives, because you want to see the Spirit change the community, because you want to see the Spirit show up and do spiritual things, he says, strive to excel in building up the church. Strive to step into, pursue, chase after building up the church. He's saying, listen, don't, don't check that stuff at the door. Don't check your spiritual gifts and your hearts and your abilities and your passions and experiences. Don't check that stuff at the door. Bring it into the church and use it for his glory. Use it for his kingdom. Use it for who he wants us to be about. 
Bridges are built into the community. Bridges are built among us. Bridges are built from mind to mind and heart to heart when we be the way that God has made us to be. Next, bridges are built when we default to being others aware. When we default to being others aware. If you've ever raised a child or if you currently have a child in your home, like a baby, baby child, you know that the default is not others' awareness. The default is me awareness. They kind of break out of that a little bit because we train them up like when they're four, five, and six, and then they get teenagers and it's like, oh, no, we're defaulting back to, to me firstedness, right? And then we raise them up through teenagers and we release them off into the world and now we're like, okay, you, you, are, you are adults who have been formatted, reformatted, trained up, released to go and be others aware. And when we, when we focus on others' needs, others' wants, others' desires over our own we have an opportunity to build bridges into the, into the world that God wants to develop his kingdom in. Paul writes this, verse, uh, verse 15. If your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. If your brother is grieved by what you say, you are no longer walking in love. If your brother is grieved by how you act, you are no longer walking in love. If, you, if your brother is grieved by how you carry yourself, you are no longer walking in love. If your brother is grieved by the football team you cheer for, you're no, I'm just kidding, you're no longer walking in love. I just want to make sure you're paying attention. Here's what we know. God has given us a lot of liberty. God has given us a lot of freedom. God has given us a lot of flexibility to live within his kingdom, but we understand this. Liberty must be limited by love. That The freedom that God gives us must be reined in by love. And when I say love, I mean capital L love as defined by scripture. When we exist in, in, in this love-defined diversity that God wants us to live within, when we create, when we create bodies of Christ within the kingdom that, that, are, that are reined in and, and, and surrounded by capital L love, then we stand a chance at, at being, being the, the reflection of a New Testament church that God has designed us to be. And, and we know this. We know this, this default to being others where that's a very difficult balance to strike. It's a very narrow road to walk, and we will mess up, and we will overstep, and we will lean back into selfishness instead of defaulting to selflessness. But as we pursue this kind of lifestyle, what people begin to see is that we become more and more and more and more like Christ. We begin to build different planks on the bridge to, to develop further reaches into the community, and we have a chance to, to build a bridge that God has designed us to build. And then lastly, as we wrap up, this thought is this. Bridges are built when we keep our faith where it belongs. This, this, is, a, this is a tough one, especially in, the, in these United States. We build bridges when we keep our faith where it belongs. Paul writes this, verse 22. He says, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. Now, at first glance, this verse kind of reads like, listen, as, as, you pursue your, as you pursue your God, just keep it between him and yourself. Make it personal. Make it your own. Don't feel like you have to bring other people into it. Don't, don't feel like you have to spread your wings and tell other people your story. The faith that you have, just, just keep it very high and tight between you and your creator. But that's not at all what Paul is saying. What he's saying is this. Listen, this faith that you have, it must be maintained with the Father. It, it's easy for us, especially in these United States, to, to pad our faith with, um, with intellect. It's, it's easy for us to pad our faith with finances. It's easy for us to pad our faith with comfort or, or, or the pursuit of things being more comfortable or a big old fat 401k or a full plan for one year, three year, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25 down the road. Paul's saying, listen, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. There's absolutely nothing wrong with any of those things in the right priority, but Paul is saying, listen, this faith that God has called you into must be anchored fully in the hope of Christ and nowhere else. It must be anchored not in food, not in drink, not in traditions, not in what you inherited from mom and dad, not, not in the things that grandma and grandpa used to do. It must be anchored in the hope of Christ. Keep your faith with God and don't let it wander. Don't let it get off track. Don't let it tick one degree here and two degrees there and three degrees there. Keep it anchored in the hope of Christ. And then he says it very, very clear. Whatever doesn't start with faith, whatever doesn't start with faith will always end in sin. So keep it high and tight. 
And when the body of Christ anchors our hope, anchors our faith in Christ, the bridges that God is wanting us to design and build and in the community begins to happen little by little by little by little. We read these verses already at least twice this morning, but there's, there's, there's a whole argument in Romans chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 that hinges on this section of scripture, that hinges, as a matter of fact, on that word righteousness. Let me read these one more time. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus, in other words, whoever serves the Lord this way, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual up, up for, what, what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Paul is saying this. My whole argument, this is Paul speaking, his whole argument in the latter part of the book of Romans hinges on the understanding of righteousness. Hinges on the understanding that, that we must be made righteous in the name of Christ if we want to be a part of any of these things that he calls us to. Without Christ, there's no peace. Without Christ, there's no joy. Without Christ, there's no hope. Without Christ, there, there's no design for us to be built or, or for us to be built as individuals or as families at the church. This whole concept hinges on the righteousness as provided by Christ. Jesus is very, very clear. There's, there's, there's one way to the Father. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And that's it. There's, there's no other pathway to righteousness outside of the things that God has done through Christ for us. We understand this as, as people, as, as, as households, as churches, we are designed to grow in, in health. We are designed to grow in depth and knowledge and understanding of our creator. We are designed to grow in number. We are designed to reproduce and become larger and bigger. But it must hinge on the righteousness of Christ. Anything outside of that will fail. Anything outside of that will burn. Anything outside of finding our faith anchored in the hope and righteousness of Christ is faulty and will, will trap us and those who are around us in, in a less than kind of faith that will not result in, in our salvation. Reminder of our bottom line, that walking with Christ is about building up the right things and tearing down the wrong. We talked a lot about the things that God wants us to build up. We understand this, that righteousness, this thing that hinges the whole argument of the book of Romans, righteousness is possible only through the name of Jesus. Freedom, freedom the thing that God allows us to walk within the parameters of his design and freedom, freedom is possible only through the life of Jesus Christ. Being built up and growing in height and depth and numbers and numerically is, is possible only through the name of Jesus. And, and permanently tearing down and leaving behind, stepping away from and living a life free from the things that we have torn down in our lives, the wrong things, are only possible through the life of of Jesus Christ. Walking with him allows us to build up the right things and tear down the wrong. I don't know. I don't know how this hits you this morning. I don't know what God has placed in your lives, in your minds, in your, in your hearts, in your desires that, that he, is, he, is, he is calling you to pursue, to build up in him. But I know this, this is a call to do those things. And I don't know what, what God is calling you to tear down what God is calling you to walk away from, what, what God is calling you to, to literally destroy and, and leave behind and live a life free and unfettered from all that stuff. I, I don't know what that means for you, but I know this. This call in Romans chapter 14 is a call to do just that. So whatever, whatever in your life those blanks are filled by, Paul is urging you now to fill in those blanks and trust the freedom of Christ. Trust the freedom that comes with a relationship with Christ. Trust the freedom that comes with the righteousness of Christ. So like we do, we're going to spend some time praying now. Uh, Josh and Tabitha are going to lead us through a short time of worship here at the end. Just a time for you to process some of these things. A time, of you, a time for you to, let me put it this way, begin to respond to what God is calling you to do. If you have questions about what that looks like or, or need to have a conversation or, or wonder what the next step would be, man, I'm your guy. I would love to talk to you about that. Ladies, a man is your gal. She would love to talk to you about that. We are here to walk and talk and live this life together. Because as we walk with Christ, we will mutually, mutual upbuilding, 
we will build up the right things and God will put us in the places where we have been empowered and have the authority to tear down the wrong. And we want to do it together. Let me pray. Oh, Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the freedom that, that your words through the Apostle Paul grant to us 2,000 years later. Thank you that the original hearers and, and, and readers of these words were probably, probably rocked to their core very similarly, similarly to the way that some of us may be rocked this morning. I believe sometimes we, we have the mental ascent that we know that you want these things for us and we know that you call us to these things and, and that you, you even grant us these things. But the leap or maybe the bridge between the mental ascent and, and the practice of those things, God, it feels so vast sometimes. So in the stillness of, of this moment, Father, and in the observation of, of, of the, the vastness of the gap, I pray that you would speak into us. I pray that you would allow us to incline our ears into the things that you're speaking to us today. May we hear your voice. May we recall a verse of scripture that has been instrumental in our faith. May we begin to, to understand and, and, and parse, parse, parse this faith for the very first time. Father, I pray that, that you would illuminate for us the things that you want us to be about today. I pray that you would just light them up, that beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you are declaring this for us today. If, if there's anybody in the room this morning who is yet to, to repent from a lifestyle and step into the kingdom that you have designed for us to live in, if there's any of us this morning who, who have yet to give you full control, full control of our hearts and our souls and our minds, full control and full access into our spirit, Father, I pray that this is the day where that happens, that this is the day where that conversation begins, that this is the day where that transaction begins. Or maybe those in the room who need to return come back to it, develop this, this lifestyle of repentance that you call us to, this lifestyle of turning away from self and turning towards you. God, may today be a banner day for that. In all things, Father, I, I fully believe this is what you're speaking to us in the book of Romans. In all things, our hands are open, our, our palms are, are upturned, and we trust you along the way. Father, help our disbelief. Cause us to believe and help our disbelief. May we respond in faith, in assurance. May we respond with yes and with trust. And may we respond the way that you want us to be about today. So, Father, we worship you, and we pray that you would speak in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise and worship. Venture family, it has been such a wonderful morning worshiping with you. But before we wrap up today, I want to make sure that you know, if you feel God is speaking to you about something specific and you'd like to talk with one of our pastors, please text Venture Info, all one word, to the number 97000. Then select Connect with the Pastor, and one of our pastors will be in touch with you this week to set up some time to connect in whatever way works best for you. Thanks again for joining us this morning. It's so awesome that we can gather from all over and worship God together. Love you guys, and I will see you next week.